Welcome to the Armani Talks podcast. I'm your host, Armani Talks. In this podcast, I'm helping you level up your communication skills every Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If this is your first time on the channel, welcome aboard and be sure to join me for future videos on impromptu speaking, social skills, creative writing content, so you can become much more articulate in expressing your ideas. To stay updated for the latest videos, hit that subscribe right on below, hit that bell notification, and never miss another video again. Today, we are back for Unapologetic Truths, Episode 6, with Harsh Strongman, Life Math Money. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Arman. How are you doing today? I'm doing very good, Harsh. And I wanted to open the episode by saying something to you. Congratulations on hitting over a quarter million followers on Twitter. Uh, I've already DM'd you about this, but I wanted to open the episode by saying that. So down the line, when we listen back, we have a rough estimate of when you hit this milestone. So congratulations. Hey, thank you so much, Arman. Yeah, it's really cool that Twitter has been so kind to me and my account has been growing really fast. I think we went from 250K to... We added 3,000 followers in a single day, which is really cool. Yes, and in the end of episode one, I bought this up, but I did want to bring it up one more time. You're one of the bigger accounts that goes out of your way to bring awareness to different accounts. So it's not like you're always hogging the spotlight. You're always helping other accounts rise as well. So, I mean, thus far since uh, knowing you, I believe I got at least 2,000 plus followers from a lot of your shout outs. So I just did want to bring awareness to that about how you shared the spotlight with others as well. Well, it's really about having an abundance mindset, isn't it? Because let's take someone who will never share their prosperity with someone else. That's a person who thinks that by helping someone else grow, they are somehow reducing their own growth or they they, they, they think that it's a zero-sum game where by helping someone else, they have lost something. It must have been to their own detriment because they have given something away. But if you have an abundance mindset and the previous mindset is called a scarcity mindset. So mm-hmm. with an abundance mindset, that's not how you think. With an abundance mindset, you think I have a lot. And if I give a bit, it's going to increase even even my own. So if you think about it, by helping other people, it not only helps them, but it also helps me build a network. It helps create goodwill. It helps people in general because there are more uh, good accounts out in the world tweeting great ideas, good concepts, good knowledge. And Mm -hmm. it's helping other people grow their brand, their business, etc. So I don't really know why someone would not share their popularity. But it is how it is. It's human nature. Most people have the scarcity mindset. I try to avoid it. Yeah, and you could even say that at a baseline level, that's what we're programmed for. Uh, For example, a little kid who's getting his first ever uh, candy bar, uh, he's going to be eating that candy. And if some other kid's like, let me get some of that, the kid immediately is going to be like, no, this is mine, right? Yep. But over time, this kid has an option of whether he wants to change his line of thinking and give this person the candy. And it's even different than just giving the person the candy because they ask. It's a completely different concept when he's giving the candy out of his own will. So that's what I think you've been doing because no one really asks you for these shout outs. You're just every now and then making others aware with your own goodwill. Yes. Although if someone did ask me for a shout out, it exponentially reduces the probability that they will get one. (laughs) It's one of those things where you just have to wait. I had that happen to me recently where this guy wrote a comment on one of my tweets. I retweeted him and then he jumps in my DMs and he's like, hey, thank you so much for the retweet. How about you go through my entire Twitter feed, you follow me and you give me a shout out as well. I was like, well, damn, buddy, you have a lot of requests from me, don't you? <laughs> yeah, that that comes off as somewhere in the middle of begging and entitlement where 
what i don't even know you and you want me to spend all this time and then risk my reputation on endorsing something that i'm not even fully aware of and mm-hmm. if these guys knew the impression they were giving away they would never do it but they did lack that self awareness to really realize what the other person is thinking by reading their dm exactly and it's all about leading with value and just to give you an example of the opposite of someone asking for a shout out uh, the guy that uh, created the thumbnails for this episode and the last episode uh, on twitter he goes by at game spells g a m e s p e l l s game spells and i'm going to link his bio in the description box right on below but basically he introduced himself to us by creating a thumbnail of one of the past unapologetic truths episodes out of his own good will and then he was like hey uh, you could use this if you would like now i'll be very open i'm not a good graphic designer at all i'm very basic rudimentary but this guy uh, he has a business out of graphic design and he's someone who opened by leading with value so just out of good will i'm going to be like yes i will include uh, your name in the description box for anyone else that needs graphic work done for their business that's the proper way in my opinion to start a relationship because even though he's a smaller account he knows that in the world of value it doesn't matter how much followers you have and all that it just matters if you're making someone's life better or not agreed and to add to leading by value if you can't think of anything you have to at least offer something like uh you know i would i respect someone who says okay i will pay you x amount for a shout out although i have never accepted money for shout outs mm-hmm. but i would respect someone more if they offered money than if they were like can you go through my profile and give me a shout out because there's a sense of entitlement and then there is business and no one likes someone who feels entitled to your time attention or whatever absolutely I mean that's that's just a process of thinking and it's not something that is done overnight it's just different ways that you can just look for opportunities now a question for you harsh let's say someone is new to a field or let's say they're just starting off what are some ways that you think they could contribute value when they don't have that many skill sets do you mean contribute value to their customers or to potential business partners like us or anyone else uh, let's do the latter uh, potential business partners i think the simplest way out and the one that seems to have worked for a lot of people who have approached me is to find out where the person you are trying to con- contact is not doing so well or maybe they're making a mistake or maybe they are doing something that could be done better and then just give it to them like tell them that you're doing xyz and you can do it better by doing it this way and that seems to work really well because when someone trying to tell you something that is of value to you you're going to be receptive to it regardless of whether that person is popular big small or any other reason simply because you have some self interest in uh, connecting with that person because they have something of value that you want that knowledge that they're giving you so that seems to be mm-hmm. the best way to give you an example if you take someone who is doing youtube and their thumbnails suck well you could off- you could just make a thumbnail like this guy did and send it could talk about me man <laughs> <laughs> and send it to them and be like hey you can use this one this is better and if you are say a graphic designer then you can then pitch a service or if you are a copywriter you can point out where the copy sucks in the sales page and how it can be improved and if someone takes your suggestions then you can optionally also say okay i'm a copywriter would you like to hire me and that is a better way of approaching and pitching people than just going in their face and saying hey i do xyz thing you should hire me because people have no experience with you they don't know whether they can trust you or not there are lots of other people doing the same thing So if you can give them something that they would want for free first just a little bit then they mm-hmm. are far more likely to want to connect with you. That's good advice and that's business advice and that's also just networking advice as a whole 
Because in one of the first companies that I worked for, when I first started my career, uh, one of my managers was like, you know, Armani, you got to go out there and you got to network with people because that's how you rise up. And that's all he said. Now, being a young person, I believe I was 23 or 24 at the time. I didn't exactly know what that meant. So I started to go to a bunch of these networking events and I didn't know how I could provide value to these vice presidents, these senior managers. But over time, what I started to learn was a thing called primal value. And primal value is basically curiosity and listening skills. A lot of these people of power within the company, they didn't necessarily care too much about these skill sets or the practicalities yet. But what they did want to see was some hunger or ambition from the new generation of people that were entering the company. So simply by asking them very targeted questions and showing curiosity and showing enthusiasm, I was able to give them value. And then they started to invite me for different sorts of lunches and different opportunities that other people were not getting because they weren't leading with primal value. So I don't know if that's a concept, Harsh, but that's something that I started to realize throughout my journey that certain times, if you don't have too much skill sets, let's say you don't even have copywriting skill sets to offer, if you can just open with, hey, this is what I like about your content and here's why, that's some primal value that you can add rather than immediately asking for something. Hmm. I think the you- reason why this happens is because people who are older and of value, let's say they are successful themselves, they usually have a human instinct to want to mentor someone else. Like they want to pass on what they have gained in terms of knowledge and connections. And Mm -hmm. they they wouldn't just do it for anyone. They want someone who is intelligent, curious, and someone who really respects them. Which is why when you ask them pointed questions to show them respect, they try to help you. They try to invite you to their events. Because they're trying to mentor you. I think that is a factor here. Like No one it wants is. to help someone who is visibly lazy, unreliable, disrespectful. And no, no one would want to even be around that person, especially in a professional context. But if someone feels that you have a real shot at success, and especially if they see their younger self in you, then they are far more likely to want to mentor you either directly or indirectly. Well, the younger self in you part, uh, do you want to expand on that? Because I have a general understanding of what you mean, but I feel it's more profound than I'm thinking right now. Okay, so most older people who are successful also tend to be serious people when they were younger. That is, they tend to, they they were curious and intelligent and they wanted to achieve something. A lot of them were that way. And Mm -hmm. when they see someone young who is like that as well, they can relate to the situation and then they want to help them. See, let's take that, let's say that you are a football player and it took you a while to learn how to kick the ball in a proper way. Mm -hmm. And it took you, say, three months to struggle to make that particular type of kick. And then you had someone who was much younger and you were looking at him and he started to do the same thing. Your first instinct is going to be, well, this is how you do it. Like You will go and show it to them. But if there's someone who just doesn't care, like he is like lying around and you are not likely to go and say, okay, come here. I will show you how to do this. Like if someone's, if they think that someone is trying to succeed, then Mm -hmm. there is a human desire to want to help someone like that. No one wants to help someone who does not appreciate that help and does not want to succeed in the first place, or at least does not visibly want to succeed. Dude, that's so accurate because I'll just tell you a personal story that's relating to the point that you're making. When I was doing Toastmasters, after you do a certain amount of speeches and evaluations, 
you become the mentor of your club and you start to mentor a new person that's entering the club. Okay. And I was assigned two different mentees. I'm not going to say their name, but let's just say one person reminded me of my younger self who was, uh, had a lot of speech anxiety, but was curious to learn. And then there was the other guy who was very nonchalant. He thought he had it all figured out. And it was just, as I was giving them both advice and guiding them towards their speech, the guy that had speech anxiety was so freaking curious about how he could improve. He had that hunger to improve where he started to eventually win a lot of the ribbons. Where the other guy, the guy that was so content, whenever I would give him some advice, I could see from his body language that he wasn't paying attention. His eyes were all darting. Uh, he would ask questions that were not even related to the points that I was making. And he was just so proud. You know what I'm saying? And eventually, it was just unique to see the difference between both of these guys, their entire trajectory. So when you're saying that uh, people want to mentor people who they see themselves in, I can agree with that point because for the first guy, I wanted to mentor him more because he wanted to learn. And that just reminded me of my younger self. I think that if a guy is successful, at some level, you feel proud that you have contributed to their success. Have you had any of those moments, Harsh, where you don't have to name drop, uh, where you gave an upcoming account a shout out and they exceeded your expectations? I have helped over 20 people or at least 20 people who I directly know and at mm-hmm. least 100 or more people go from working some 9 to 5 job to earning more than a full time income online and some of them make more money than most people imagine we're talking like more th- than 10 times the median wage of their countries wow and what do you look for personally within their content? Is this some sort of truth that you're looking for? Or is this something just general and it resonates with you? Oh, I, I don't have a parameter for this. By reading their content, I can usually figure out whether the person has experience or not. So one thing I'm looking for is that by reading, reading the content, I have to be able to know that you know what you're talking about. And the problem with online and Twitter and everything is that there are a lot of people who are fake experts. That is, they claim to be experts in something, but they don't really know anything about that topic. And (laughs) that's usually because a lot of the people who are starting Twitter accounts are what, 19, 20, 18 year olds. And they will pick topics like the psychology of life or uh, something like personal finance uh, and it just doesn't make any sense like there, there are people who will try to talk about personal finance and they don't mm-hmm. even have an, an income source and how does that make sense and you can tell that by reading their content you can read their content and know that this guy does not know what he's talking about all he's doing is just copy pasting other people's stuff editing it a little bit and then try to pass it off as his own So I try to avoid anyone like that because if you don't have experience and knowledge about what you're talking about, you are going to fail for sure. Mm -hmm. So the one thing I'm looking for is that you have to have honest experience and knowledge about your field. You have to know what you're talking about because if you don't, then I'm wasting my time and you are wasting your time. Absolutely. It's about the experience. And that's one bone to pick. Uh, that's one bone to pick that I have with Twitter, where the algorithms, and I wrote a tweet about this, is very flawed in my opinion. Where recently, I'll just give you an example. I was going through the Twitter feed, and nowadays there's categories that you can sign up for. So I decided that I was going to click business personalities, writing, and a few other categories that they presented me with. And as I'm scrolling down, Everyone that's listed as a business personality has the keyword Elon Musk in their tweet. And I thought at first I was just 
thinking that this was a coincidence. Okay, yeah, on this particular day, they put Elon Musk, so they got registered as business personalities. I kid you not, Harsh. Three to four days in a row, it's like everyone that is on that category has Elon Musk in it. So I don't know if Twitter is trying to mess with me or if other people are seeing this. But I'm thinking, dude, it's basically as though this algorithm is rewarding people who all talk the same. And they're not bringing enough light to people who are sharing unique concepts. So where do you find that balance where, yes, you're satisfying a market desire, but you're also innovating in the process? I don't do that at all. I, I mean, at least I don't consciously do any of that. I just write about what I find interesting, whatever I learned from my life, my own experiences. And as I run my businesses, the things and challenges that come across and how I solve them, I don't particularly care about satisfying the audience. Because if I, I will often tweet things that will make me lose thousands of followers overnight. So I really do not care about satisfying the audience. I, I I'm not trying to uh I'm not I'm not trying to do any of those things. I'm just trying to share what I'm learning. It was episode three or four where we were talking about that. Uh, that's my philosophy as well. Rather than chase the market too much, uh, create your own market. And with that being said, Harsh, I have a few of your tweets pulled up. And I wanted to ask you more about it because you've been tweeting some heat recently. And folks, if you don't follow Harsh Strongman on Twitter, be sure to check him out there. And if you're still watching this video, uh, well, of course you are. Go on and drop that like for us right on below so other people can discover this content. Now, with that being said, let me pull up one of your tweets. So, Harsh, um, one of the things that you mentioned, and I have a few of them, so we could talk about a few of these. Uh, unpopular opinion, the press should not be free. And I'm assuming this was a polarized a tweet, or am I assuming wrong? Um. I don't think it's really that polarizing because a lot of people have realized how fake the news is already. So it it isn't that much of a stretch to conclude that the world or at least many countries would be better if the press was not free. And if you want to, I will explain this with an example, okay? If you take the coronavirus pandemic thing when it started all the press people were like this is nothing it's just the flu and if you think if i'm if, if you think i'm lying you can just go and look at this with their own posting history like you will find articles from april and may 2020 saying the the flu is far worse than covid19 and the only mask that works is an n95 mask and if you're wearing an N95 mask, you're killing all the medical professionals because now they don't have a mask and the cotton mask doesn't work. And when Trump tried to do something about COVID, they were all anti-Trump. So they were very reactionary. So if the, if Trump was like, let's buy ventilators and ventilators would suddenly start sucking. And people noticed that, that the media, at least when Trump was in power, they did not care about reporting or what was true. They just took what Trump said or did and anything he did was bad. Like if Trump did this, that means it's bad. That there was no objectivity there. And then suddenly the media will basically flip according to the their own owners. So if the guys who own that media channel is leftist or if that the audience of that media channel is leftist, then all the news they will report will be completely and very obviously faked for a leftist viewpoint. So now leftist people really love the vaccine. So vaccines are the best. And anyone who doesn't get a vaccine is a monster. And there is also media which loves the right and does the same thing, but on the other direction. So we're at a point where no one can trust anything the media says. Because it's all nonsense. They're, they're just saying what people want to hear, depending on who their audience is. And the media is essentially 
what 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 are they like they're just companies trying to make money and that's what they're doing they just want to milk their audiences so because of this structure where the media is a company trying to make money and they don't really care about truth honesty reporting like that and they have to well they have owners and the owners of those companies want to see the money or the owners want the media to push a particular viewpoint usually homosexuality black lives matter or whatever uh, whatever the thing they want to push the media has zero objectivity so you're not getting any real truth or reporting there you're just getting what the media wants you to see and not just that you're just getting the media is sometimes just pushing a lie in your face even when someone with common sense can tell okay this this can't really be true so i think the world or at least a lot of these countries would be better off if there was a state owned media and all these free media houses were forced to shut down or something because these guys are essentially just running interference if the government wants to do something then they want to basically depending on which side they are just sort of go try to bash the government or really support it at that point you're not really adding anything because everyone's just confused like there's so much information out there right now with these media houses and conflicting information information that you can first form any viewpoint and then find some media company just promoting that particular viewpoint and because it's the news people trust them so if you think vaccines are good you will find some media companies that will be saying yeah it's the best vaccines are good if you think vaccines are bad you will find some media people saying it's bad yeah it's bad no don't take it so there is no clarity i think that if these media houses were not free and they were centralized by the government then at least there would be some coherence and secondly people will know what the bias is the bias is that the media is only showing you what the government wants to see now what's happening is that people think the media is doing this god's free work where they're reporting honest truth when they're really not doing any of those things they're just trying to make money at the cost of your well-being and there's also a factor that a lot of the media people media houses the bigger ones they're not funded by people who care about your country a lot of them are funded by the chinese and foreign governments and they run interference for them so the chinese government funds a lot of the media companies today and mm-hmm. they do it because they want to publish pro china news or they want chinese propaganda available to a global or at least an american audience it happens in india as well so it becomes really hard for any government to politically act against china because if they do so then china will start maligning the, their local government in the newspapers they fund so i think that due to a lot of these factors these news organizations as they exist today and the free press quote and quote is turning out to be a net negative on the country and one of the fundamental flaws that i notice is just the business model when you're predominantly making 50% of your income from ad revenue that means you need more eyeballs on your content and how do you get more eyeballs on the content by strictly sharing the truth or by every now and then sharing truth plus uh, doing a lot of fragmentation scaring people uh, creating that story that's going to shock people uh, create the headlines that's going to make people be like huh i got to click that uh, a lot of these uh, journalists nowadays are uh, great copywriters because they know how to break these emotional buttons and hook people in um have you ever heard of uh, penny newspapers i have not so when media was first uh, becoming more uh, bigger with information technology rising Uh, initially it was intended that artists uh, were in control of the media because it was just uh, the general notion that artists are going to uh, distribute true knowledge or quality content 
But over time, there were businesses that were starting to learn that this spreading of information had a perfect business model. And over time, uh, there was a thing called penny newspapers, which were being released. Since now there was a money that was attached to information, a different company started to spring up and they were looking for different ways to get their papers sold. And what do you think was selling more papers? Uh, honest journalism or from the business hat, uh, the ones that could get people's curiosity more? The curiosity and that's when the, ones. Yes. And that's when the phrase uh, yellow journalism was starting to become on the rise. I believe nowadays there's a remix to that. Because it's not necessarily the money, the penny newspapers, but instead it's new media competition that's coming. Where nowadays there's accounts like you, for example. Uh, you probably get more impressions than a lot of news organizations from your tweets. There's blogs with single owners that the media companies are competing with. So that's why I believe they're becoming more and more bad behavior with their uh, content because they're trying to capture more of that attention. You see what I'm saying? Hmm. See, attention is really a zero-sum game. So what they essentially, as you said, they're trying to do is they're trying to be so polarizing or they're trying to create such clickbaity headlines that people will click them so they can finally make some ad money. They don't care about honesty because honesty does not pay the bills. Yeah, and it's a business at the end of the day, which people need to understand. That's why media literacy is such an important subject. Uh, there's a free, uh, there's a lot of resources, uh, and you have to find the right resources for yourself. I'm going to link a free course in the description box that I think can help people understand the concept of media literacy. But yeah, Harsh, uh, what is have media your, literacy? I've never heard of it. The, yeah, so it's basically the ability to create media, uh, to curate media. The ability to scope past uh, information and see the intent behind uh, who created the content. Okay, so let's just say in a nutshell, it's the ability to create media and spot quality content. And this is a skill set where nowadays, uh, if you're just going through the internet and you're one of those people that's like, oh, well, it's on the internet, that means it's true. That means... <laughs> where a lot of people are like that, man. Uh, that means you have low media literacy. But if you're someone who understands how to create media, which helps you spot quality content versus propaganda, that means you have high media literacy. So I believe this is going to become a very important subject in the upcoming generations, especially because individuals are now a days becoming creators. You there, know what there's I a first think would happen? I don't think it would become an important subject. I think what would happen is that people will just stop trusting all media. I think that people will not try to differentiate whether uh, this particular piece of information from this media channel was true or not. The media mm -hmm. people are going to reduce the credibility so much that people will outright distrust them. It would essentially become a comedy show. And this is happening to a large extent. I was talking to this girl who is a family friend and she might be what, 15 years old and 10th grade. Okay. So she's in 10th grade and I was talking about some news event and she looks at me and she says, oh, it was in the news. Hey, all news is fake. And she just said that <laughs> point blank. And I was a little taken Whoa. by surprise because I did not expect someone so young to realize that. So I think that we are already here after after Trump popularized the words fake news. It's become very common that people are aware that a lot of the news is not as accurate as the claim to be. So I think that I don't think people are intelligent enough to study things like media literacy. I think people will just outright distrust the media. And they will trust individuals who they think are honest. For example, there are people on Twitter who I trust. And if they told me some event happened, then they are likely to trust, or at least I'm likely to trust them. So I think that journalism will be scaled by individual journalists. And all these big journalists, uh, big news houses will not have that trust required for them to have any power. Mm-hmm. 
Oh yeah, I wanted to bring up something harsh because in our last talk we were briefly bringing up uh, wrestling, um, and there's this TED talk on uh, where Eric Bischoff. He was basically a very important figure in one of the wrestling organizations, and he was in the talk talking about how modern media has taken the blueprint of pro wrestling and is running with it. <laughs> it, it it's a compelling talk, man, because he makes a case for. Uh, how nowadays news is entertainment, how it's a story, how they try to capture your attention. Uh, it's definitely a talk worth checking out, and I'm going to link it in the description box right on below. It's by Eric Bischoff. That's really interesting. And yeah, that's very interesting that the media is running with wrestling as their business model. And yeah, I, I can see the truth to it. So where do you think people should get their information from then? individuals i really don't have a good answer here i think that they should get their information from people who have established their credibility over a long period of time mm-hmm. but even then they should be aware that people change and in your country harsh have you noticed people that have gotten so brainwashed from media that you can't even recognize them anymore that happens everywhere i think any that close friends of yours not particularly i'm not in touch with a lot of the people i used to know from back in the day but mm-hmm. i do know some people who became either too extremely ideological in whatever ideology they picked or they just don't care yeah in the us there's so many mindsets that are getting warped and i'll give you an, i'll give you a story so do you remember i don't know if you use instagram too much but do you remember a couple of months ago when everyone was posting those black squares uh black squares no i i don't i don't know of that event Yeah, I don't know. I don't use Instagram too much, but I think it was a message to uh it, it was in regards to Black Lives Matter. Uh, I I'm not too aware of that because I don't use Instagram that much. And there was this one account that, you know, I went to college with and I barely talked to the guy and he's basically DMing different people who didn't post a black square and he's like, "Hey, uh, I'm just hitting up different people uh who haven't posted the black square yet and I'm asking why haven't you posted it?" and when will you post it any messages me i'm like man first of all i barely post on my instagram and two it's none of your business what i post you know and three i don't even know you like that for you to be requesting what i post and not so this was a guy i mean i sort of knew him in college i didn't know him that well but he seemed like a sane individual but at this point he was so obsessed with this narrative that he just act so out of character just hitting up random people uh, basically harassing them and his tone was off too uh, so i was just curious if you had moments like that wherever you're from mm-hmm. it, i can't think of yeah. any moment in particular all the mm-hmm. other people who will aggressively try to get you to do something on their political or some other side but no i haven't had moments like that but i typically Um, I don't have any social media accounts that are. I have the last time I had a Facebook account was two thousand fifteen, and that also I barely used. So I, I just don't have any social media accounts. So I'm not in touch with lots of random people. They have no way of getting in touch with me either. And you mainly stay in touch with people in general through phone and WhatsApp. Yes, although I I don't stay in touch with people unless I think that they're going to be someone who is important or relevant in the future. Uh, if I think someone's a loser and not going to do much in life, I'll just delete their number. I don't care. I don't care. And if they if I get a call from unknown numbers, I rarely pick them. So, I have to ask Arman, what happened after you told that guy that you will not be posting his black square? Did he so, go all uh, you don't care about black lives because you won't post a black square or something? Surprisingly not. 
I basically just told him my piece and he didn't respond back after that. But every now and then, Harsh, you know how you could just get a vibe of something? Mm -hmm. I was getting the vibe that he was irate. And that's why I wanted to bring it up with you because there's these people that have nothing else to focus on other than monitoring what others are posting on a social media. And I mean, I shouldn't have even responded back, but I did just for just because I wanted to. But to yeah, he, he didn't respond happened. back. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, bro, try me, man. And, you know, who uh, who does stuff like that? You know what I'm saying? Uh, you got to post this. Otherwise, uh, you you just don't care. And they're trying to paint that narrative. Yeah, they're trying to emotionally manipulate you into posting it or you know, intimidate you in a way, aren't they? Yeah, and I'm just not that guy. And I'm not even that active on Instagram. Even though every now and then people that discover me on Twitter uh, follow me on Instagram, they're like, come on, man, you got to post more, man. <laughs> I'm probably just going to use your strategy where I take my tweets and I post it on uh, Armani Talks IG. Uh, so even I don't use Instagram that much. What I do is I use this software and what this, the software will automatically screenshot my tweets, then mm -hmm. put them on Instagram on its own. So I don't monitor Instagram almost at all. Like I will very rarely check Instagram. I think having too many social media accounts is a waste of time. Like There's just not enough content. You cannot produce content all day. I don't know enough to be producing content 10 times a day. I just don't, especially for different social media platforms. So what I do mm -hmm. is I just use Twitter content and I put it up everywhere on Instagram, on Telegram, on Facebook. And I use software to do it. I don't manually do anything. I don't waste my time on things like this. So a lot of people on Instagram, sometimes I will check the comments and they will be like, this guy sucks and he doesn't know what he's talking about. But <laughs> every time I check, I have like five, 600 more followers. So there's that. It's very interesting that people will almost always comment things like this post sucks. You're, you're, you've changed your content starts to suck now, but your follower count is growing. So what does that tell you? Right. From what I've noticed, Harsh, so initially, I used to have a very negative perception of Twitter, where I used to think that it was just Facebook statuses. And I was thinking, why would I use Twitter when I have Facebook? Uh, the idea was just ludicrous to me. And then over time, I started to become obsessed with Instagram. Uh, I used to try to wake up early. And I followed this page called the 5 a.m. Club, which basically just gives you motivation to keep on waking up early. There's a brotherhood uh, of people that are other waking up early as well. So you know, I feel in love with Instagram. I think those things are very valuable. The, those communities that push you to do something like waking up at five. Like if you don't have yeah. that, you are likely to just sleep in on a day you're tired. But if you have a community, then you are going to be like, okay, I'm motivated to wake up at five. Fuck everyone else. We're going to make it. Yeah. And those communities are are, are something that's not notice too much and i'm glad you brought that up because i was going to bring this up later on in the episode but i believe this is a perfect transition so you wrote this a tweet that i'm going to bring up and then before you give your thoughts on it i want to explain why i'm bringing up this particular tweet mm -hmm. so you wrote if you're an internet entrepreneur you will have trouble staying friends with people working regular jobs simply because when you go out they're at work and when they go out you're at work now, before you give your thoughts on this, so I have a bunch of entrepreneur friends from different parts of the world, and every now and then when I talk to them, they say stuff like, man, dude, it's so hard for me to relate to other people now because no one really understands what I'm going through, and a part of me feels lonely, and I'm like, huh, okay, and then I'll have a call with another person who's probably in Philadelphia versus the first guy who's from Canada, and he'll say something of the similar lines. So when I had these conversations and I saw your tweet, I saw certain similarities. Do you think that since entrepreneurs, especially on the internet, are so different that loneliness could be an issue? 
I'm not very sure if the reason is that they're different. See, here's what happens, okay? If you are a regular entrepreneur working in the physical world, you are going to be working somewhere around nine to five because that's just the time where the world works. But if you are on the internet and you're working, you will work in the morning and at night, sometimes in the afternoon, whenever you feel like it. You you don't have a set time that I work from nine to five. For example, right now it's 9 p.m. on a Sunday and I'm on this call with you. So it isn't, you don't have a set time. And often it's far more convenient for you to do things at different times from the rest of the world. So before the pandemic started, I would go to the gym in the afternoon because then the gym would be empty. So I would not have to wait for equipment. Does that make sense? Or Mm -hmm. if I have to go to a particular place, I would go there at a time where there would be no traffic. So you would, the, the you rarely end up in a situation where you are encountering lots of people because you are generally avoiding that. And also that because you're not in a traditional workplace, you're not in physical contact with lots of people. Like If you're in an office, then all the people who go to that office, you will become friends with them and you will get a lot of social interaction. But when you work on the internet, you don't get that social interaction and that's why people feel lonely. I think that's the reason. I don't, it's, there's also the factor that most people who are inter- internet entrepreneurs, they think differently, they have a different mindset, which does play a role. But I think the fact that they operate in different time zones, essentially, they operate, they do things at different times from other people also plays a big factor. Like, the reason someone is lonely is that they don't have enough people around them. They're not getting enough social interaction. And internet entrepreneurs, what are they doing? They're in their room, in their house, and they're working on their computer. They're not, they don't have people to talk to around them. They're not in in an office. When they're going out to the gym, they're usually going at a time when the gym is empty. So they don't get a lot of interaction. And you can somewhat counter that by going out on dates and whatever, but it's not as much social interaction as you would have gotten had you were working a regular job, had you been working a normal job or doing something that involved a lot of human contact. Are most of your friends entrepreneurs, Harsh? Not most of them. I would say a good 50%. I have many friends on the internet now because of the business I'm in, of writing, blogging. Friends come business partners mostly. And I relate to those people a little more than I relate to people in real life nowadays simply because of the business I'm in and the life I'm living right now. And mm-hmm. see, I'll give you a, an example, okay? If I want to go out on a Thursday, well, if if I did not have anyone online and I did not know any entrepreneurs who are also on the internet, I just couldn't go out on a Thursday with someone because everyone's working. They're not working nine to five or like in India, it's like nine to nine. And <laughs> there's this loop, mm-hmm. it's just impossible because- You guys work nine to nine? Uh, I think most people, at least in corporates here, their work timings are from 10 to 6, 6.30, But gotcha. we have a lot of traffic. So to reach office at 10, they have to leave at 9 or 8.30 or whatever. Some people even have to leave two hours, three hours early. And by the time they're leaving office, the work culture in India is a little different from how it is in the West. So if the official ending time is 6.30, it's likely that these guys are leaving office at 7.30. Then you add their commute and whatever in and they're at their home at 8.30, 9 o'clock. And by that time, everyone's too tired to go out. Okay. Okay. Uh, you could continue. You were making a point. Oh, yeah. So what I was saying is that if you are an internet entrepreneur, it's going to be very difficult for you to continue to stay friends with people who work regular jobs because you will barely see them when you are working they will be free and going out and when they are working you will be free 
It's a conundrum. And that's why I wanted to bring up this point because we were just talking about communities. And this is why, uh, you know, something as small as just, let's say you wake up at five in the morning, you're automatically doing something that the general public doesn't do. So having that group of people that are like, you know, I, I, hey guys, this, I'm- sorry to interrupt you, but just to continue what I was saying earlier, if you work on the internet, your work life is very similar to a housewife's where you're mm-hmm. working in the morning, like sending the kid to the school or whatever, and you're working at night making dinner and you're going to the gym in the afternoon. So when I would go to the gym in the afternoon, the only people in the gym were either someone who was unemployed or housewives. <laughs> so I find that very interesting. But yeah, go it's ahead. It's a unique parallel. But you were saying, yeah, it's, it's very unique and very interesting. And, huh. you know, I did. I don't, I don't typically tell people what I do. So I bet they all just assume that I must be unemployed because I'm in the gym at 3 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's always working out and doing squats. <laughs> oh, yeah. So people will often ask me if I'm an actor. And that's because they're trying to ask me, like, do you have a job? Like, what do you do? <laughs> what do you normally say when, let's say, a relative asks, what do you do, Harsh? I do affiliate marketing. Okay. And the general, uh, like, relatives, do they understand what they, that means? Or do they say something like, oh, when are you going to get a real job, Harsh? I think they understand what it means. Like, I, I don't know if they understand it completely or not, but they have a rough idea. Like, I'll just tell them a little bit about selling things online. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't really heard much about getting a real job. Like, I, I haven't heard any of that yet. You ever read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki? I have not. I skimmed through it, but I found it to be extremely basic, at least the pages that I did read. And I think it's because mm-hmm. I am an accountant. Like I have a proper certified education in accounting. I'm a chartered accountant by education. So for me, right. it's like too basic, not worth reading. Yep. But Robert Kiyosaki is an entrepreneur. He writes books and he makes cash games. He's worth a couple of millions of dollars. But he says even nowadays How when he goes... How much Bitcoin is that? <laughs> a lot. Uh, but every now and then when he goes home and his parent or his family asks him, uh, do you have a real job yet? Or what do you really do? Uh, they still don't understand what he does despite being an author. So, uh, because I believe he's from the Japanese descent. Uh, so in that philosophy, uh, getting a job is the norm. So when you're an entrepreneur, it's difficult to put it into words exactly what you're doing. Uh, fair enough. At least in my Hard case, to- when I say I, I, I just say I, I'm in business and people will typically not ask too many questions. Mm-hmm. Are you a part of any organizations or clubs? Um, so I am a chartered accountant. So there's something called the ICAI, which is the Institute of Chartered Accountants, where I'm a mm-hmm. member. Although I don't think I have ever attended or you know done any meetings there in a long time. Otherwise, no, I'm not a member of any clubs or anything else. I found that uh, um, joining organizations, Harsh, uh, if an entrepreneur is going through loneliness, does help tremendously. Uh, For me personally, I mean, I talk about Toastmasters a good amount. Uh, Another club is BNI. Have you heard of that? I have not. It's called, uh, I believe it stands for Business Networking International. And I used to be the communications chair for them. And this is basically when uh, business owners from around your local region get together they talk about their business and basically the different members find out how you can refer them business and it's a great concept especially because you start to understand different business models so when i was in my local bni chapter i immediately volunteered for leadership positions once i had the time and i got to see the behind the scenes of for example how a lawn mowing business works and the lawn mower guy for our chapter was pulling in over a quarter million dollars a year uh, running the service. And there's another guy who builds houses. So if you're someone that's going through loneliness and you're an entrepreneur, I know BNI is a, a global organization. So see if there's an organization near you that you can 
I check out a few meetings on and network with other business owners and entrepreneurs. How did you come across BNI? So initially, Harsh, when I uh, released my Level Up Mentality book, I was very brand new into how to market and get the word out there. And one of my close friends, who was a, a motivational speaker, uh, he was a part of a BNI, and he's like, you know, Armani, you got to network with different business owners uh, just so you get different marketing ideas. So he gave me the idea. I went on Google and saw that there was a BNI uh, chapter five minutes away from me. So I was like, whoa, I could actually walk there. And they're very strict, Harsh. They have a system. Okay. So if you're going to join, you can't just show up whenever you feel like it. You show up at 7 a.m. every Thursday, and it's required that you do some educational training every week. And you schedule at least two meetings with the other members throughout the week. So once I saw the organization, I was like, yo, I'm hooked. I, I like this. These people take this stuff seriously. And that's when I eventually started to work my way up. And I became the communications chair for my chapter, uh, basically the guy that wrote the newsletters and threw events. So this was my chance, Harsh, to see how businesses operate as a whole. You're going to see lawyers uh, trying to get their practice off the ground, chiropractors, uh, people that own lawn mowing businesses, uh, food delivery service. And it was just a brotherhood or better yet a family because a lot of women were there as well. And uh, I believe there's a chapter in uh, in India as well. So you should definitely check it out. Hmm, interesting. So it's like the physical version of the Fastlane Forum. The Fastlane Forum. What's that? Oh, you haven't heard of it? There's a book called The Millionaire Fastlane. And there's a forum uh -huh. associated with it. And they have a lot of very good posts. There's a lot of entrepreneurs on that forum. And they have uh -huh. a lot of very good ideas, business advice, and content that I think people should check out. If I was 16 years old today and I had to start a business, I would first read the crap out of the Fastlane Forum. Fastlane Forum. Okay, let me make a note of that. And is it uh, with biz different business owners, entrepreneurs sharing their experiences? Yep. People cool. sharing and business it ideas. It's, it's completely free. People will discuss how they overcame some business challenge or let's say that people were declining. How, they, they, they might ask a question, okay, I'm trying to raise money and everyone keeps declining me. What am I doing wrong? So you might get a lot of different perspectives. It's, it's a very cool forum. I really like it. I don't check it much, but every once in a while, I'll just go and find it. I do get a lot of sales from that place because people will link my Twitter guide there and people will buy it. So it's a pretty interesting place. Do you find that nowadays people just recommend you through word of mouth more often? Or do you find yourself intentionally marketing as much as you used to? A mix of both. A lot of people do spread word of mouth and that's usually people will screenshot an article or a tweet and send it to their friend. And sometimes I'll just do marketing in the sense that I might say something that I know is going to go viral. Or at least it's it's good. it doesn't have to be controversial. I just like it, some, some things are like so general that they, Everyone can relate to them. Well, Harsh, the ones that I noticed that gets a lot of traction is the one where, you know, it seems obvious, but I guess it's not as obvious where you're pointing out differences between men and women. So my intention behind those particular types of content is not to generate a lot of engagement. What Life Math Money is about is about helping men live the best life possible, okay? It is for men by men. Life Mad Money is for men. And one important aspect of being a man and living a great life is knowing how to deal with women. And to do, to do that, you have to know how women are different from men. Now, where do most guys mess up? They assume that women are men 
and they think that women will respond to things how they would have responded but that's not how women are so i'm just trying to teach them that women are different so you deal with them appropriately right so to give you an example if i ask you am i looking fat in this shirt i'm expecting an honest answer if if you think i'm looking fat you would say yes i would not get offended but that is not how women work if a woman asks am i looking fat the answer is no <laughs> you remember when i was first launching my website what you said to me i don't remember i'm so sorry no 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 i mean it's fine because it highlights exactly what you're saying So this is when you and I I just published a blog on your website on how to become a better storyteller. I'll link it in the description box. And I was like, "Yeah, Harsh, I'm working on my website too. It'll be ready in uh, one more week. I want your opinion." So next week, I get my site published. I send it over to you, and the first thing you write is, "It looks very amateurish." <laughs> ah, and, I remember. Yeah, it looked it looked like crap. You made it off that Wix or something. Yeah, well, I had someone make it for me. But when you said that in such a direct way, that's exactly what I needed to hear. And when you told me that, I was like, "Thanks for the feedback." And I got it redesigned and I showed it to you, and you're like, "Whoa, this one looks way better." But this just highlights the point of how guys communicate. We're very direct and to the point. Yeah, women are indirect. Okay, I'll, I'll give you more examples of this because it's a very interesting topic or at least I find it interesting. men communicate very directly where if i want to eat a particular thing i'll just say i want this and if i don't want something i'll say i don't want this i will not try to make you guess and i will not i will not try to communicate indirectly but women do the opposite thing women don't like communicating directly they are very indirect so let's say it's a birthday and she wants flowers she will not say i want flowers for my birthday she will keep hinting it or she she will not directly say it she will just expect for you to figure out that she wants flowers and then just give it to her right uh, or to give you another example women have this indirect style of communicating which almost makes them anti confrontational that is if they think that you're not looking good or you're just doing something wrong they're not so likely to come and tell you that you're doing something wrong they're just going to ignore it or pretend like it's not a thing but guys are more direct like they just tell you okay this is what you're doing wrong you've got to fix it or whatever so i think that there's a big communication difference between how men and women operate <clears throat> there's also the factor that women want to do certain things but they don't want to say they want to do them for example have you ever been on tinder and seen those things like uh, not doing hookups right right yeah they, i've seen that before they they're doing hookups like, that's not what the reason they're saying that is because they don't want to think that they're horse so indirectly what they're trying to communicate to you is that you have to be subtle like she just doesn't want to feel like her which is why she is putting that in her profile but that doesn't mean it's true but if a guy said i don't do hookups he he would mean it like he's not going to do it well that's what the bios uh, do you notice how different women and men's bios are a lot of men don't even fill it out in their dating profiles or they'll just write their name but for women it's extremely descriptive it's a story and you can just see the difference between how they use the bio where men they probably don't even read it they just look at the image while women look at the image plus read the bio yeah probably women are men are more visual than women are like men you yeah go ahead There was this there's a show called Seinfeld and there was this one episode where Seinfeld gets his ex-girlfriend uh, a gift and the gift is money and she was so offended she's like you got me money you couldn't even get me a real gift and he's like 
no, look, you could buy anything, anything you want you with that want. money. <laughs> She's, but it was so freaking direct. She was livid. That episode was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, and a guy would be so happy to get money and not some random shit he does not need. You're right. It's like, oh, thank you, man. Thank you for giving me that money. And now I don't have to return that tie that you got me. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's very interesting how women and men are so different. And it has to do with evolution. But that's a digression. Like I, I don't mind going into it, but it's up to you. Yeah, let's go into it. Uh, what do you mean by evolution? Well, historically, women have depended or have depended on men for their survival because they just are not so physically strong. Their bodies are meant for bearing children and not fighting wild animals and doing farm work. So, what would happen is that historically that is millions for millions of years a woman could not survive alone if she was alone she would very likely die so she would have to find a man and then find a way to get that man to become attached to her so that that man would share food and resources and protection with her which is why women became very indirect because when you are very direct and when there are two people who are direct there's a very high chance of conflicts happening so what happened was that men stayed direct but women became very indirect and subtle in their communication so women would read the man's mood and then indirectly try to manipulate him into doing what she wanted rather than directly telling him what to do because if she directly started giving him orders then the relationship would not last and she would be left alone and she would die does that make sense it does make sense so evolution has programmed women to be indirect for their own survival and what women are today to today women are independent they make their money and live alone or they don't necessarily depend on a husband or a man to survive that hasn't changed the genetic structure they are still indirect communicators well i saw you retweet a tweet and i'm not 100% certain if it was from you but the tweet said something along the lines of if you want to get what you want from a man rather than trying to be more egotistical and try to compete with him you should actually leverage femininity and I saw some something along those lines of, from something you retweeted and I saw this in action a few days ago harsh where in this podcast uh, there was this uh, woman that was going to confront this one man uh, for something that happened behind the scenes regarding a podcast show that they did before mm-hmm. and the way that she came at him was very very aggressive and immediately what happened was that that guy returned back with as much aggression and you know just with men their voices are much deeper and they know how to yell if they need to so since she came at him with that much aggression he fought back with that much aggression as well and later on what started to happen was that she altered her strategy where rather than being uh, very very aggressive she started to change it completely she started to become a little bit more agreeable and she started to uh, deliver her message in a different way Uh, in a much warmer way and that's when the guy was changing his stance uh, much more than he was before so it just it reminded me of that tweet that you retweeted earlier where you're not going to overpower masculinity with more masculinity you can work with masculinity with femininity hmm i didn't i don't remember retweeting this but i think that it is true i think men have evolved just as women have and the way men have evolved is to have basically a need and a desire for sex and you know reproduction because women control the womb and women have evolved to manipulate men into getting whatever they want from that guy so men respond well to femininity men have this biological need to want to provide and protect someone so if a woman is feminine then biologically most men will become understanding and helpful by default 
Right. And this is this mainly applies from what I've noticed to masculine men, where if the man is himself very feminine, a pushover, then I've noticed that they gravitate towards masculine women. Did you notice that? Somewhat. But, you know, the thing with masculine women is that they want a guy who is even more masculine than them. So these men are <laughs> left alone. Like They're the worst of the worst in a way. Because women are hypergamous. Okay? Women want someone who is better than them. And a masculine woman would want a man who is more masculine than they are. And every time you see a relationship where there's a masculine woman with a wimpy man, that's that's a compromise where the girl just could not find a better guy for whatever reason. Maybe she was too old or not beautiful enough or no guy liked her, which, which is probably the case because guys don't typically like masculine women. So this is all she was left with was this wimpy dude who she ended up marrying so yeah it it's that polarity happens but i think whenever you see a relationship with a masculine woman and some feminine man it's usually something that happened out of necessity or a lack of other options so you're saying they settled for them i don't think this the word settled would be appropriate i would say that even though the heart does not want it and the heart wants something wants something else, this is what is fair market value for them. Got it. Like I don't I don't think that even though they may feel like settling, if the market says this is what they deserve, then this is what they deserve. Do you get me? Right. And did you wanna explain what hypergamy means to uh, those people that don't know what it means? Oh, the idea of hypergamy, or at least the concept is very simple. It means that a woman always wants a guy who is better than them. And that makes more money, taller, stronger, smarter, more well-versed, better traveled, or whatever. A female will always want a guy who is superior to her. If she sees you as inferior to her, she will not be attracted to you at all. So a guy will does not really care about this. Like a, a guy is completely fine with dating a girl he thinks is inferior to her in status and intelligence, height or strength, whatever. But women are not. They are biologically hypergamous. That is, they want a guy who is above her in status, intelligence and all these traits. Which is why you will often see that a woman making, say, $30,000 will only want to marry a guy who makes $30,000 in one. Like They want something a little better than they are. Would you say that's why success is so important for a lot of men? Oh, for sure. Because, see, evolutionarily, a man is likely to reproduce if he's successful because hypergamy is going to pick successful men. Women don't really care about success as much because they already have a womb. So it's guaranteed that they would reproduce, which is why women tend to be less ambitious because they did not require to be ambitious to survive or to procreate. And which is why men tend to make better comedians than women. It's because men needed to be funny, to be well-liked by women so that they are able to reproduce. But women do not need to do any of those things. A woman does not have to be funny or charming to get laid. A man does. Comedy is a superpower with men. If you could figure that out, that is something that's not bought up enough. I'm glad you brought that up. Because when we're thinking of a confident individual, Harsh, one thing that I see nowadays is that People talk about mental toughness a lot, which I think is great. I think being mental, mentally tough is not is better than just being a flat out wimp. But I think what's even better than being mentally tough is having that sense of play to you as well. Where if your face is always super strict, uh, it looks like you're constipated and you're showing mental toughness. Yes, that's going to work in one facet of your life. But I've noticed that this group of people often struggle with social skills. Yeah, it makes them a while- killjoy. Yeah, well, on the other hand, when you have a sense of play, Harsh, 
you simulate the same exact effects of mental toughness. And to give you an example, I used to play a lot of competitive sports growing up. And one thing that would happen in competitive sports is that every now and then you'd get hurt. So let's say I was playing basketball and I rolled my ankle. During that game, I felt a lot of pain, yet I was having so much fun playing the game that I decided to continue going on forward. Now, that's the same exact effect as mentally tough. But in this one, the spirit is much better. So I think nowadays, you know, we've pushed the mentally tough mantra enough. I think if you could say, listen, let me know how to have fun, how to have play, then you start to embrace elements like comedy, which, in my opinion, signifies true confidence. If you know how to be funny around different interactions, that to me shows me that you're a confident person that's comfortable in your own skin. Hmm. You know, what you're talking about is a little different from mental toughness, toughness itself. Mental toughness is about being able to go through with what you want to do, even in the face of adversity. What you're saying is something a little around, around the lines of not taking yourself very seriously. And No, 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 no. I actually mean exactly what you said, where you're facing adversity, but you're not doing it with a strict face. You're doing it with a smiley face because you're still able to push through that. I, I, and that's where I think what you're saying is like, don't be like the military guy who is like always frowning and always not a very happy person. Correct. I would still say that that comes from taking yourself too seriously and not taking life a little lightly and, you know, not having enough fun. Like if your approach is that every you're, you're the most serious person in the world, you, you can't smile, frown, have fun. You know, you're just not going to enjoy life. Like you might achieve some things, but it's not, it's not going to be a fun journey. And this ties into something that we were saying earlier, Harsh, where I was giving you the example of that one woman that was trying to take down that man with aggression, but she was not working. But once she switched her uh, philosophy, that's when it started to work better for her. And I noticed you every now and then do the same thing where uh, let's say there's people coming at you rather than name calling them and tearing them down, you memeify them. You, you turn them into a meme and you make one of their chins, for example. And there's that element of play that you introduce, which allows you to automatically assign yourself higher social value. See, the thing is that when <laughs> someone comes at you... Like, the simp slayer. Yeah, the simp slayer. So when, when these guys are coming at you, they're not coming at you with the intention of even listening to what you have to say. They're just having a knee-jerk emotional reaction to what you're saying. And they just trying to humiliate you by, like, say, if some the people who think I'm older will try to humili humiliate me by calling me an uncle, like, this guy must be an uncle. Or, you know, this kid doesn't know what he's talking about. Like, they, they don't care about what you say. They don't care about any explanations. So by giving an explanation or by justifying yourself, you're not helping your cause. You're just digging your hole further. The only Do people assume... Yeah. Do people assume that you're very old? Yeah, people assume that. Even though I do repeatedly say that I'm 25, but people assume that I must be. But the people who don't read my tweets and the people who don't follow me and just found one particular tweet they really did not like, their default mm -hmm. assumption is that I'm old. So they call me an uncle. <laughs> so there's no, there's no logical response I can give them that will make them change their mind. The only thing I can do is make fun of them. And usually that is because almost all of them are obese and have this chin hanging down. They have like zero testosterone. And I would say that 99% of people who do not like life math money tend to be simps, wimps, and just very low masculinity men. Like It's just, I'm not even making a... I'm not even trying to humiliate. I'm just saying a fact. Like this is a fact. Like all the I can see your profile pictures, and almost all of them have this hanging chin, and the guy looks like he's never seen the inside of a gym before, and it just very soy people. And and you're not even trying to attract them in the first place. You 
know who you're trying to attract. Yeah, I don't care about them. They just come at me and they act like I was tweeting specifically at them. So they interject themselves in my tweets and then they get mad that I'm making fun of them, but it is how it is. I just use them for free publicity and money. So, you know, I'm happy that they're there. Like mm-hmm. every line needs a victim. Yes. And what we were speaking about earlier was that for men, uh, confidence is a big part, especially success. That's why they strive for it. And you talked about before the concept of fake it till you make it. Uh, did you want to break that down, your uh, perspective regarding that concept? Okay. So you know, before I get into, get into my thoughts on fake it till you make it, I would love to hear what you have to say about it. Because I think that there's, there's a very high chance that we think about it in the same way. I'm glad you asked me. Because for me, I wrote a thread about this on Twitter a couple of months back. And I talked about two concepts, Harsh. Fake it till you make it and face it till you make it. And I liked both. Uh, Personally, for my life, I've done the face it till you make it mantra, but I didn't know that I was doing that. And basically, the way that it works is exposure therapy, where you just keep introducing yourself to whatever's scaring you little by little by little. And to take it even a little further, you're gamifying the entire concept. So whatever's scaring you, you're breaking it down into small little levels and you're gradually winning yourself over. And to give you an example, uh, initially uh, the whole concept of public speaking terrified me and I didn't know if I was ever going to go back after I choked my first speech. But what I started to later on do was the process of gamifying. Once I moved, I had level one, find a Toastmasters club near me. Check. I faced that. Level two, go inside a Toastmasters and sit down on the chair. Okay? You don't have to participate or anything like that, but at least just sit down in a chair in a meeting. Check. I passed that. Level three, participate to do an impromptu talk. The first time I failed, second time I volunteered, level three accepted and gradually harsh i'm facing it till i'm making it and i'm building more confidence to tackle on the next layer and the next layer so that's the mantra that i follow face it till you make it rather than fake it till you make it even though i do see utility with the whole fake it part as well Hmm. i think that for people who are just starting out with whatever they're doing some amount of fake it till you make it is almost a necessity, you know, because let's say that you are in business and this is your first deal. What's going to happen if you tell your client that this is your first deal? This is the first time you're doing this. They're going to run away. They're going to be like, oh, no, not are this you guy. sure? Like, I, 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 he doesn't even know whether you will make it or not. And he doesn't want to be at the in a situation where he paid full price to hire a guy with no experience only to end up in a situation where the thing didn't go so well. So so it, it, it'll be very, very difficult for you to find a client. If you have had no clients before, you just you just have to fake it. Like you have to fake your expertise, at least in the beginning. And I, I don't I don't mean to say technical expertise per se, but at least the confidence part of it. You just have to f- act like you know what you're doing just to make everyone in the room feel comfortable. And eventually you will have gained enough experience this way that you will no longer have to act. So I would say fake it till you become it is a more apt way of putting it, but fake it till you make it is good enough and it works and almost everyone does it. And the only people who criticize it are trying to get you to think that they are holier than you. And like, let's be honest, like, how did you get your start? How did you start when you didn't know anything? You acted like you knew something. And that's what made people trust you with the business. To give you another Absolutely. example, okay. if, let, let's say that you're a guy okay, and you've never had a girlfriend before. And you go on dates and you, Tell a girl that I have never had a girlfriend before. 
there's a very high chance that she will not date you simply because you've not had a girlfriend before because she's going to think he must be some weirdo or she will feel that this guy must not be wanted by other women which must mean something is wrong with him because he's not in high demand so then there's obviously he must be low value so you just have to act like you know what you're doing so that's just how it is like you have to get your break somewhere and you do that by faking it and there there's like there are some lines that are gray areas where if a job if an entry level job wants you to have experience now i'm not saying you should lie on your resume but if everyone starts expecting entry level jobs to have experience you will have no option but to lie on your resume yeah it's the conundrum of you're trying to get your first job and they're like what's your job experience and you're like well i need to get a job to get the experience <laughs> So yeah, I mean, see, if everyone starts asking for that, then you will have to at least mislead people in your resume, which can be done by, you know, coming up with some small freelancing business and doing that for a bit, and then saying, yeah, this is my experience, or just saying, yeah, I have experience, and you don't actually have to do the freelancing part. So it re- it really depends, but. there are honest ways of faking it like you just fake your confidence like i remember my first business deal i i did not know enough but i acted like i was confident and which just made the client feel confident in me and he gave me the work i did not say that i'm very experienced i did not have to put that in words i just pretended to be that way and they just made the assumption and i did not correct them right and that's one of the best ways to sell where you're going from the guy that's just trying to sell to the guy that's trying to teach where for my business harsh a lot of my business i have to actually get on the phone and close a lead and whenever i'm closing the lead what's happening is they're very curious regarding the subject and the more that i'm giving them answers the more that they're selling themselves so when you can take the uh, all the spotlight off of you and start to address the needs and the desires of the other person it helps out tremendously uh, with your first business deal harsh are you referring to life math money or no, something no 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 not life math that? money uh, it was my consulting business as a chartered accountant and do you have to do a lot of sales for that somewhat but not really not that much it's it's more of uh, your clients referring you other clients thing but mm-hmm. yeah not not that much to be honest got it so your perception of fake it till you make it is that it's needed especially when you're brand new in a field it's much better than than just saying no i don't know anything and i'm a complete beginner yes because 99% of people will not have enough confidence with in you and they are not willing to take the risk of hiring someone with no experience they just aren't that's just how humanity works like people, what would they gain by hiring someone with no experience like if you screw it up then they're screwed and if you don't screw it up then they've gained nothing like they might as well have hired someone with experience so it's that weird place like you're in that place where you're outside that circle and you need to get in the circle but the way to get in the circle is to be in the circle mhm so you just have to find a way to break in and this is uh, this can actually lead us towards social anxiety where people that have social anxiety what they do a lot is let's say they forget a certain point or they fumble a certain word they get caught up on that where people who are charismatic or socially intelligent what they do is every now and then when they make a mistake they kind of give you that look like that's what they were going for and then they proceed on anyways so uh, rather yes, than i think fake it till you make it is one of the best things you can do if you have social anxiety i definitely agree and i think it's a very good point that you brought up yeah and um when you're creating content harsh do your followers have any form of social anxiety or do they bring it up to you in the dms 
Uh, not really, not that much. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they do. Like you know, given the size of my audience right now, I bet there's a good portion of them that do have social anxiety. Mm-hmm. And the thing with social anxiety is that you know you're even anxious to bring it up, right? Right. So maybe I do have some articles that might be of use. Mm-hmm. But the best way to treat social anxiety, Arman, as you said, is just exposure therapy. Like you just go out and you deal with it. Yeah, and when I was first starting Armani Talks, I was predominantly known as just a public speaking account. And there was one tweet that I wrote that the fastest way to overcome social anxiety, and this is probably the last thing you want to hear, is public speaking. That's the fastest way because you're tackling the beast head on. And if you could speak to uh, 50 people with ease, five people become light work. But as soon as I bought up that tweet, I got all these DMs from different people who are like, hey, uh, tell me more. Yo, I'm socially anxious. Are you sure that this works? And I was getting a whole bunch of questions regarding this harsh. So that's why I ended up creating Charisma King, which is my personal book. Uh, I'll link it in the description box regarding social intelligence. And I break down social anxiety, social skills to an art and science. And then I give the two paths, which you just bought up is exposure therapy. This is where you're incrementally speaking up more in interactions. Uh, This is the slower path, but it's very reliable. And some people are like, man, I want to overcome this ASAP. If that's the case, tackle the beast, man. Uh, Take care of public speaking and you'll notice you feel way more confident in yourself. Have you ever had social anxiety? Yeah, man. I mean, so for me personally, the reason that I had it was because uh, I consider myself a lifelong underdog where for most things in my life, I didn't ever have it come easy to me. It took a lot of work. And I believe that this is a good thing because this creates the staple of the Armani Talks brand. Where nowadays, uh, the Armani Talks brand specifically helps shy entrepreneurs and professionals build more confidence through communication skills. And the reason that I can create these hyper-targeted concepts, Harsh, such as do public speaking to overcome social anxiety, is because I'm speaking from experience. And I know that it works because it's worked on me. And when people apply my advice, they'll report back their findings and they're like, dude, it actually works. You're right. If I could speak to 20 people with ease, speaking to five people is easy. So... It's not like you're going from here to there, Harsh. It's honestly about knowledge. If you give the person the right knowledge and they take action in it, then it's going to work out. And just to add on a little bit onto that, Harsh, I would recommend people stop calling it social anxiety, even though like you know, we're calling it right now just for the sake of the episode. Call it being start to call it. Well, <laughs> that's, so what that's what it is. Like, so someone who's afraid of social interaction Right. It's really just being scared. Like, there's, no, well, there's no polite way of saying it, but like, you're just being a pussy. Well, I was going to say call it social excitement because anxiety and excitement are pretty much the same feelings. And even though it seems like a small difference in wording, you'll notice over time that your perception completely warps and you start to feel differently regarding the same feelings. Where right now, someone's like, oh no, I have speech anxiety. I don't know about for you, Harsh. But that phrase already sounds very depleting. So you want to f- associate positive words to the feelings and you change your perception that way. I think it's a negative affirmation, you know, when you say, I have speech anxiety. Well, you just reinforce the concept that you have something. See, this is why right. I don't believe in depression. Like, what are you doing when you say you're depressed? You're just telling yourself that you're depressed. You're reminding yourself that this thing exists and you are it. On the other hand, if you don't believe depression is a thing, you can't be depressed. Hmm, Okay. Uh, Have you ever talked about this before? About what? Uh, Depression? Uh, Depression. Uh I have an article on it. And it's basically me mocking the concept, to be very honest. Really? And do you find... Okay, let me see how I can phrase the question. Do you ever see a case for depression or do you think it's because of poor knowledge or poor understanding of how to tackle it? See, I do, I'm not doubting that depression doesn't exist. 
I don't think it has that much to do with some magic neurochemistry. I mean, it probably does have an aspect of that. But the reason I think it happens is because people have very shitty lifestyles that they're not exercising, they're not eating right, their body does not have the right nutrition, and they're not getting enough sunlight, and they're spending too much time on the internet and looking at screens, watching TV, and outrage. And I think that the reason they feel depressed and out of energy is simply because of their lifestyle. And not because there's something wrong with them or there's something wrong with their their genes. Like if I was living like I was eating McDonald's three times a day and watching TV all day, not having a social life at all, just sitting in my room and not getting any sun, not getting any exercise, being obese, I would feel depressed too. So I, I think the concept of taking medicines to solve depression is bullshit. I think that 99% of people with quote-unquote depression are just people with shitty lives. And if you fix your shitty life, you will not feel depressed. And have you ever personally went through a moment where you were sad for a prolonged period of time? No. That has never happened to me. Gotcha. And let's say someone is going through that, Harsh. So you would say fix your lifestyle? Yes. Uh, any go to other the gym, advice? eat well, get enough sunlight, make some friends, go out, talk to people. That is going to fix a depression. Not popping whatever pills they give you. So they give pills. I, I saw someone um, write a tweet about that recently. It went viral. And it went super viral where I don't know much about the pills side of it or where there is an industry on that I, I don't know much about it so i can't speak too much on it but is that normally the prescription that's given i think so and I, the reason i feel that is so i used to know this girl from like in in india and she moved to the u.s and after she moved to the u.s i saw a whatsapp series of her and she used to be a very normal happy girl okay and she had like two bottles of I, in, in the US, apparently, they, they give pills in bottles instead of packs. So she had two bottles of antidepressants in her hand. And this was like a couple years after moving to the US. And she had a picture of those in her hand. And she had written on above her WhatsApp status that if we should take care of our mental health and take our antidepressants and anti-anxiety stuff. And I was like, what? Like, why do you need antidepressants and anti-anxiety? Like you live in the best country in the world now. Like why are you depressed? It makes zero sense. I think that these doctors are just prescribing it to anybody. Like you don't need pills to fix a shitty life. To fix a shitty life, you just have to fix your shitty life. And the reason you're feeling bad and depressed is because your life is shit. I mean, if I, or if you lived in a way where you're just living in your room all day, staring at a screen, getting no exercise, your diet is shit, you're going to feel like crap. And because you're doing it every day, you feel like crap every day. So by fixing your lifestyle, you will feel better. It's common sense to me. What about uh, the people, Harsh, who go through depression because they lost uh, like a loved one, for example? I mean, for that, it's a little different. I think that's a short term thing. Like, I, I bet people are going to be depressed for some time, but it's not normal for people to stay depressed over losing a loved one forever. Like, mm -hmm. Humans have been losing loved ones ever since the beginning of humanity. And there's a period of mourning, and then, you know, the hedonistic treadmill, like people's happiness levels come back to normal. I don't think it's normal for people to stay depressed for a very long time because of a death in the family. I mean, I'm not trying to ridicule them here. Like I understand, but mm -hmm. it's not normal. Right. See that. Uh, see, folks, this is the thing with Harsh Strongman. You're always going to get his uh, truths regarding life. And by the way, guys, if you're still listening, be sure to drop that like for us right on below. Uh, did you have anything else you wanted to add on to this topic, Harsh, before we transition? Uh, no, I think we're cool. I will say that if someone is truly depressed and has been taking 
antidepressing pills for a long time i would urge you to also try to fix your life like go to the gym and try to eat right and i bet that you will feel much better not in one day but in like 3 4 5 weeks you will feel much better meditate a bit find the time to do these things like it it's really worth it yes and i'm going to give my two cents as well harsh where personally for me i'm not a big guy with pills just in general like if i'm super sick the most i'll probably take is a tylenol but even then i don't like a tylenol you ever heard of that no it's you ever heard of motrin motrin no i just like a it's nothing uh spooky harsh they sell it in <laughs> uh, walgreens i don't want you to think i'm some sort of weirdo <laughs> okay. but yeah, yeah but so i'll just max take that but that's even rare so i agree with you in that uh, regards where i don't know much about the depression pills as a whole but I try to do something natural before resorting to that and obviously people know themselves hopefully the best but personally for me man anything that i'm putting in my body it has to be something that i must put in so this pills and stuff that i'm not 100% certain about i'm always going to be cautious of that yeah man i'm not comfortable taking random pills like even sometimes when i fall sick and a doctor will give me something like antibacterials i will sometimes not even take them like i'll just i'm just fine like i'll just be fine and some days it's okay i don't need medication like mm-hmm. if i get a cold i won't go to the doctor i'm like this this is going to this is going to heal itself in a couple of days i don't need medicines for this but i know many people who will rush to the doctor on for the first day of a cold like got to fix this fast but i think that it's something your immune system is designed to handle so let it yeah and that's where everyone's body is different that's why personally i don't know much about this and i'll 100% say it uh, for me for example harsh the last time i went to a doctor i have this thing um where i i'll get a bald spot every now and then it's called mild alopecia and when i get it i'm supposed to go to the doctor and get this foam so that's the very rare occasions that i go it's probably once every 2 to 3 years that it happens oh wait you and, get a bald spot and then you have to go to the doctor to get some foam Yeah, so I get this foam. I put it on my head for like 2 to 3 weeks it's, it's and my hair grows back. The what? It's the same thing. Like it's the same foam every time or is, do they keep prescribing you something different? No, it's the same thing each time. So why do you have to go to the doctor again and again? Like you can just buy it from the store. So what happens is um they sell it in a very small uh container and you have to get a prescription for that. Oh right in the US they have prescriptions so in here you can just buy whatever you want like you don't need a prescription to buy anything you can just go to the stores tell them what you want and they'll, they'll give it to you Really Yeah I don't think I've ever needed a prescription to buy anything Yeah and it's not what everything that you need a prescription for but certain things they won't sell it over the counter if you don't have a doctor's note on it here they will sell you anything if you can pay for it they'll sell you anything i think this is better because like what is the government doing like why are they trying to pull us you like what they're acting like a babysitter aren't they by telling you what you can and can't buy right i, I don't know if there's a reason they have that policy i wonder if someone overdid it before where a lot of the stuff were like a pain a killer like what you i heard it's like, easy to get addicted why would you take a painkiller unless you're in pain like i, I don't get it addicted well, to what harsh, like why would you take a painkiller if you're not, if you're not hurting well harsh people actually do that here where um i heard a story about this guy who got addicted to painkillers because when you take it it makes you feel euphoric wait and let's say let's say you're someone that's consistently in pain then you may overdo it and then what happens is when you're addicted and you're trying to get rid of it there's huge withdrawal effects where your body starts to shake you can't sleep and you're getting muscle spasms isn't that what happened to jordan peterson i thought that guy was doing drugs i'm not very sure what happened to him okay i don't know if he got uh, caught with painkillers but i do know that this is a thing harsh where that may be why they're monitoring it you know i would say that 
this is maybe 0.1 percent of the people i i don't know how uh, how it is in the us but in india i would say less than one in 1000 people is probably doing something like that and it, it does not really make sense to restrict everyone's ability to buy drugs just for stopping that 0.1 percent from buying an extra painkiller because to get a prescription you first have to go to a doctor which should which is not always necessary man like sometimes you just know what you need and you you can just go buy it from the store or the doctor will tell you that if this happens just take this and you know you you're just wasting the doctor's time your own time and your money by going to the doctor to get a prescription for the foam thing when you know you're gonna get, get the same thing like you already know what the prescription is going to be so why do you why are you being forced to pay for the doctor's time and waste your own time going there and spend give him like money for giving you the same prescription i think that at least in india the costs of doing that to society are way higher than the costs of whatever some weirdo is taking extra painkillers for mhm in india is there any problem with drug usage over there in certain states i think in punjab i've heard that there's a lot of drug use uh, because it's right next to the pakistani border so the pakistanis mm-hmm. are assholes like they'll send drugs all the way to india just to fuck with us and since it goes to punjab first a lot of people in punjab are addicted to drugs like i was reading an article where there's this guy who is addicted to heroin and his wife finds out and then his wife also becomes addicted to heroin because she's very annoyed that her husband is an addict so mm-hmm. to deal with that annoyance she starts taking the heroin <laughs> what <laughs> it's really funny but also very sad man like dude you have to be at a certain mental state to try something like that don't you have to inject heroin into yourself i have no idea man i have never really taken any drug i i've never even had weed or anything I never I've never done anything recreationally. I, and you've never tried alcohol, you never I tried alcohol a couple of times when I was very young like 15, 16, 17 I think. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um but not really no I haven't really done any of that. I don't want to do anything mind altering it just goes against my moral values and religion so to speak so. I don't I don't even care about any of these things. Well that's good because this is this is something that can help you in the long run when you're not dependent on any drugs or uh, where it's easy to become addicted and i told you a story in one of our past episodes about uh this guy that i knew that got uh what do you call it addicted to alcohol after his breakup and to this day uh, i mean he he's still trying to find ways to deal with it and to overcome an addiction i mean it's a time consuming process it's say it's a process let's just put it like that hmm i think the world is better off if people just don't consume drugs or if these drugs were not not a thing because uh these addictive drugs like heroin cocaine they just cost too many lives and too many years so It's not just a simple matter of quitting cocaine. You have to avoid it for the rest of your life because most people are not strong enough to say no if offered again. Mhm. So if they found themselves in the same environment, they will likely consume again. Right. Um have you heard of a Donald Trump story regarding alcohol? How he doesn't drink it and why not? I have read two of Trump's books. Uh, I I read how to get rich and how to think like a billionaire and mm-hmm. I think the story is that one of his uncles died and he used to drink a lot and so he doesn't It was drink. his brother. His brother. Okay. It was his brother. Mhm. And I I noticed that him uh, th- that's what happened with him. A uh, Floyd Mayweather Jr. He's a boxer. I don't think you heard of the name. And 50 I've Cent. I've heard he's of a- Floyd Mayweather just because of Twitter. Apparently there was some popular match with some guy called Khabib and the guy was relevant that time there's another guy right there's three or four of these people floyd mayweather 
Khabib mm-hmm. and one more guy. Khabib and Conor McGregor. Yeah, McGregor. Yeah, the guy with a lot of tattoos. Yes. Uh, so Floyd Mayweather is the boxer from them. Uh, the other two are UFC fighters, and uh, the third one is a Fifty Cent, who's a uh, rapper. Yeah. Yeah, singer rapper. And all three of those, uh, they don't do alcohol. Well, 50 Cent sometimes does it. But the main reasons as to why they don't is because there's a memory that scarred them from the past. For Trump, it's his brother passing away. For Floyd Mayweather, I believe something with his uncles and his mom happened that scarred him. And for 50 Cent, something with his mom or his relatives that happened with him that prevents him from even touching alcohol. And this ties into a concept we were bringing up a while back, where the reason I don't play video games at all is because I got scarred from that moment <laughs> after my roommate beat me that day. And he did what? After he beat me in that game, like he obliterated oh, me okay, in the yeah. basketball game. I thought he said and it beat just, you that day, and I was like, what the hell? Uh, no, no, no. In the basketball game. And it was, it was so freaking bad harsh where it scarred me and i was just like no nah, i'm not gonna play that so i wonder how many people out there in this world don't do something because that underlying narrative is uh, dealt with pain where they got scarred from it have you heard of a guy called Connor murphy isn't he a youtuber yeah he's a youtuber and i saw a video where essentially this guy has a history of doing something called ayakusha i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing it correctly Mm-hmm. and the guy has gone batshit crazy and by looking at him I am never even going to touch Ayakusha and if someone's going to do it and I find out about it I'm going to stop them from it and it just scared me to the point that I would not even I would not even touch it so yeah what do you mean he went crazy the guy went crazy like literally crazy I'm not, I'm not exaggerating he went insane Wait a minute. I know exactly who you're talking about. And I know exactly why you're saying he went crazy. Because you're talking about the big guy. Uh, just for clarity, right? The big muscular guy? Yeah, the big guy. muscular guy, yeah. Dude, I saw this one video where he was talking about drinking semen. What? Yeah, that yeah. sounds like him. Uh, see, that's enough to just be like, all right, I'm scarred from that moment. I'm not touching that again. Where... I understand, uh, um, you know, people who drink every now and then who uh, like who do. I'm not one of the guys that's completely against uh, recreational use of marijuana. Uh, I don't do it, but I understand that. But this is a unique concept, Harsh, where you stop doing something because you're emotionally scarred from it. You know, you're scared of what might happen. And, you know, once you see it happen to someone else, then you're like, okay, this can happen to me as well. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not special, right? If this guy can go insane, why can't I? Right. For me, another thing like that is roller coasters. Where do you guys have that in India? Yes, we do. Yeah. So here, uh, people love roller coasters. They're like, "Oh man, uh, this is the funnest thing to do." And for me personally, like my background in electrical engineering, whenever I see a roller coaster, a part of me sees like the circuitry, if the circuitry messes up, then the roller coaster can stop. And I'm I'm basically <laughs> <laughs> hanging upside down. And I'm just like, man, I don't I don't want to touch that, Doug. I'll go on a roller coaster every now and then, but it's something that I could live without. See, when I was a kid, I was not scared of any of these things. I would go on the scariest rides and not care. But as an adult, I remember going to an amusement park once. And I did not sit on this one ride that takes you up very high and makes you spin around. Not because I was afraid of the ride. I was afraid that these machines might not be so well maintained and this Mm -hmm. thing might break off. (laughs) So I was afraid of human error and apathy and not the ride itself. And the older that you become, the... Depending on your field of study, the more aware you become in some of these. Oh, definitely. Because I was thinking, okay, all the software I've written has had bugs in them. What's preventing these guys to have issues? Like, I might be the guy who might get stuck up. So you just don't know. 
Mm-hmm. And it's just how it is, you know, if the less aware you are of the potential problems that could occur, the bolder you will be. The less aware that you are of the problems, the bolder that you will be. Yeah, if, like for example, if you think you're immortal, then you will be very happy to go into any war. But when you mm-hmm. realize that you can die, at that point, you might reconsider. Well, that's why there's a time and place for logic, where when you're innovating, if you're always being logical, then you're not going to be innovating. You're going to be doing what's always been done. I don't get it. You, you elaborate. No, it's like let's say, uh, let's say you're trying to uh, create something new. Well, at that point, if you're too stuck up on how things have always been done, then it's going to be difficult to unlock those new thought waves. Where you're going to create something new, and I believe every creator uh, comes to that at one point or another. And mm. we brought up a life math money before. If you're being very logical, then there probably would be no life math money. Because there was nothing like that before you created it. Same with Armani Talks. If I'm being too logical about, well, is this going to work? No, no, no. I got to create it like this or this variable. Then it's never going to happen because I'm being too logical. You need that boldness where you're like, okay, things could go wrong, but I'm going to take that bet anyways. And Steve Jobs was a brilliant example of that. Where when he was saying, I'm going to put uh, all the... all the stuff in a computer, in a phone, and I'm going to make it one button only. That sounds ridiculous. But he was able to innovate because he was thinking in a different way. Mm, that's a good example. I get what you're saying. I think, have Are you there, heard of something called business process reengineering? Yes, I actually got my master's in, uh, uh, I got my master's in business analytics and information systems. And we had to take a class on that. I think you're talking about something very similar to that, aren't you? Yeah, it's similar. We just had to take an elective. So I know what you're talking about. So the concept is that when most people try to do something new, or you know, when, when a corporation is trying to improve itself, what it will often do is that it, it won't change the structure, but it'll try to make the existing thing a little more efficient. For example, it might add, say, if existing customer service was via email it might also add phone support or it might add better technology there Mm -hmm. but the concept of bpr is to try to think completely in a new way so forget about everything that you're already doing and think about something completely new maybe you might figure out a way to not even need the customer service department maybe you can figure out a way to make your product effect free so it's about thinking completely independently of what you already know to be true. So I think that's what Steve Jobs was very good at in, in many ways. Yes. And just to add to your point. So there was a period where I was a process engineer for Capital One. I don't know if you guys have Capital Ones in overseas or if it's just a US thing. It's basically a bank. Mm, I've been, I've, I've, we don't have it, but I do know that it's like an investment bank or something with a very high AUM, like a trillion dollars. Yes, that's correct. And when I was the process engineer for uh, Capital One, uh, basically my job consisted of uh, getting the steps that investment uh, investments required to make a certain trade happen. And I would create procedures. And then my goal was to eliminate redundancies. And that's basically completely opposite to what you're saying because you're talking about innovating, creating something new. And every now and then, like I'd see this one thing that we could do, which would completely shift everything in terms of how we ran the business. And then upper management would be like, no, 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 don't do that. Just make it more efficient. Okay. You just keep what we have already. Just make it a little bit more efficient. And this is how a lot of these big companies think. Uh, they're not trying to try re-engineering. Instead, they just want to engineer more efficiencies. Where I kind of get it from their lens, Harsh, because a small improvement for a scaled company uh, can lead to a lot of profits. But that's where guys like you, for example, you don't have too many people to answer to where you could introduce a lot of these new processes that's never been tried before without too much overhead. You know, 
I think a factor of being an employee versus being the business owner comes in because from a business owner's perspective, you're very interested in doing new things that might take your business to new horizons. But from an employee's perspective, as long as the business is doing well, they don't really care. Like by taking a big risk, they're risking their job if the thing goes badly, but if the thing goes really well, they're not going to see the gains. So I, it makes sense from their perspective because let's take the CEO. If he messes up, then he's no longer mm-hmm. the CEO. So he just wants to do, do what is required, the minimum amount, and not mess the system up too much, not take the risk. Because what is good for the CEO is different from what is good for the company. Right. Have you ever read Made in America by Sam Walton? I have not. Dude, you got to read that book. I actually got done with it recently. And it's the founder of Walmart. It's his autobiography. Mm -hmm. And his whole approach to business was so different for that reason. One thing that he mentions in the book is to give your associates information. And he would basically be very different than a lot of the other entrepreneurs because he would give a lot of detailed information to his associates. He would empower them to take risks and he would try to reward them if they thought of a idea that they could implement in terms of the corporation. And one of the examples was uh, greeters. Uh, Do you guys have a Walmart over there? I don't think so, no. Okay, well, Walmart's this huge uh, retail shop that sells everything. Yeah, and as soon as you go in, uh, there's a guy that greets you, and then there's a guy that, uh, once you're leaving, says goodbye to you. Okay. So the initial reason that they did that is because there was a particular Walmart shop that struggled with theft. People would keep stealing stuff. So the the manager for that particular Walmart was like, how about we leave a person at the door uh, to make sure we monitor? What are the stealing? Like, it's, isn't it like a grocery store or something? Well, it's a grocery store that sells pretty much like everything as well. Yeah, it's a supermarket. Yeah, so they have a grocery, but they sell like pants, um, technology. Ah, uh, uh, I see. Google I see. Hoops, they must be selling laptops or whatever. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, laptops or something as, as small as pencils. Ah, uh, okay. So, so basically, uh, that Walmart manager decided to put someone at the door, uh, and he called them the greeter. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's how the whole idea of the greeters came in from Walmart. And they passed this idea to the CEO, Sam Walton. And Sam Walton liked it so much that he immediately made it a a nationwide thing. And it took a year and a half for it to pass. But he was different than a lot of entrepreneurs because he thinks like that. Where he, He talked about the art of always having a day one mentality where a lot of entrepreneurs nowadays don't have that, especially as they scale. So it's a compelling book, man. Uh, I mean, I definitely recommend you read it, especially What's if you're the day an entrepreneur. One mentality? The day one mentality is when you're not trying to be too corporate, where the more that a company scales, the more that they forget their roots. And Sam Walton introduced a concept called thinking small. Uh, what made Walmart a lot different than uh, the competitors at the time, which were Target and Kmart, was that Kmart and Target were targeting these big cities to expand into, while Walmart was focusing on these small little communities where not too many people lived, but the people who did live there all knew each other, right? Mm -hmm. So think of like a village. And this was a genius idea by um, uh, Sam Walton, because if everyone knows each other, then if at least one person attends uh, Walmart, they want to tell all their friends. So what Sam Walton realized is that he didn't have to pay for advertising, right? Mm. So he was able to save that money and open up more Walmarts in that method. And that's what allowed him to grow astronomically while Target and Kmart were spending a lot on advertising costs because they were thinking too big. So day one mentality is focusing on the roots. Mm, That's interesting. Do you ever find yourself just revisiting the core mission statement of Harsh Strongman's Life Math Money, where you said that the business helps young men uh, improve? 
right? Yeah. Do you ever find yourself having those moments where you stray away from messaging or do you find yourself pretty much on point? It's rare for me to stray away. No, not common at all. But every once mm-hmm. in a while. But generally, I'm pretty aware of who my audience is and who I'm trying to help. Like every once in a while, I'll have some female reader reach out to me and say that, why don't you make content for women? And like, there's nothing. The, the main reason is that because I don't want to. I'm a, this is for helping men. Mm-hmm. If women are free to read it. but it's not for women. You have a lot of women followers too. I have a lot of women followers, which is very surprising because mm-hmm. all my content is directed at men for men. I, I believe there's a lot of women who do have a lot of the traditional mindsets as well. So what you're saying, they resonate with as well, but they don't publicly announce it. Yeah, I think that society has become so leftist that there's a stigma attached to being traditional now. Mm-hmm. Where if you are leftist, you can openly express extreme leftist views, like there being 50 genders and whatever, and people will not bat an eye, but you cannot extre- express extreme traditional views. Yeah, and if you do, they'll say that you're close minded, you're there's not a accepting. There's social overhang there. The- you will suffer the consequences socially. Did you notice that some people who are very conservative in one part of their life are liberal in another part? And I could give you an example if you if you want to know what I mean. Oh yeah, definitely. There's a lot of people who are very conservative in their business. They will never take a risk or big risk, but very liberal socially. And there are people who are very conservative socially, but very liberal with when it comes to business. They will they will be very happy to try out new things, and risk failure, but they are not willing to do that in their social life. Yeah, and uh, the second example that you brought up was g- going to be me tying back to that Made in America book, where Sam Walton was extremely conservative in his personal values. Right, he believed in the traditional family. But in terms of business, he was extremely liberal, always trying new things. Do you wonder why that is? I've seen this pattern happen with tons of people. Do you think it's just human nature to want to be conservative in certain fields and liberal in others? I think so I don't see someone who's conservative in everything being or liberal, liberal in everything. In your social life just doesn't work. Like just doesn't work that well. If you take someone like John D. Rockefeller. He was the same way. He was very liberal with his business. He tried new things, but he was very traditional. He was a very strong Christian and very, very traditional in his personal life. And that's simply because when are you trying to invent new things? When something that is being done previously either doesn't work or you want it to work much better. But a traditional family works perfectly. Why do you, there's no reason to change it. But a business, you're trying to grow it to try to do different things with it. And so you're more liberal with it. Mm -hmm. And the opposite, uh, where the other one, where was the other one you said? If you ask me, trying to be too liberal (laughs) with your family and your values while being conservative with your business, like that is stupid. Like being conservative in your business does, does not produce good results because you won't even escape competition. Business is about innovation. So they're just doing it wrong, plain wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm assuming that you're definitely the the one that's very innovative with life math money, but you have conservative values in terms of your family life. I lean in that direction, yes. And I've noticed this is something that happens with multiple people where I know someone, for example, is very liberal at work or very strict at work they just show up at their work leave uh, show up leave right but in their family life or lack of family life they're very liberal and for some reason man uh, lately i've just uh, been very curious regarding magnets as well like you were once curious regarding magnets and i saw that it's it reminds me of humans being magnets where there's always certain polarities that they have and certain repulsions that they have 
Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's just me throwing it out there. Where when I started to study about magnets, I saw some resemblances with people. Hmm. You ever heard of the concept um, humans shape technology and technology shapes humans? I haven't heard of it before, but now mm-hmm. that you mention it, I can see how it's true in many ways. For example, uh, if you take any technology today that is that was made to help humans achieve certain tasks, but it also changed our lifestyles so much that it ended up changing us. If so, if you take computers, it was made to help humans do things like compute and do repetitive tasks. But they have shaped humanity so differently that we are essentially completely depend on, dependent on computers now. So we shaped the technology, but that technology also shaped us. So I get it. Mm-hmm. I think the reason... Imag- uh, sorry, uh, go ahead. No, I mean, imagine the world without computers. Uh, you don't have to imagine. Like it's, you, it did you used have to a be a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's not... I'm talking about nowadays. Yeah, it, it'll be it'll be like it's... 30 years ago. But imagine where multiple people from all around the world have computers, but only you don't. You would feel like a poor person. (laughs) Let me give you another example, Harsh. Um, There's another book I wrote called The Prolific Writer, which is uh, is the holy grail of creative writing, where I break down different concepts of writing and how you could build a brand with your writing skills in the internet age. And, you know, I opened by talking about, you know, why write, right? Mm -hmm. And my thing is, imagine if someone came up to you today and said, I don't want to write ever again. I'm like, good luck. Because right now, writing is so ingrained in human culture that you can't get away with it, get away from it, even if you wanted to. Whether you're going to a doctor and filling out some application, whether you're texting a friend, or whether I'm DMing you and saying, hey, I just sent you the invite. Writing is always ingrained in culture. So that's sort of like how technology uh, is becoming ingrained as well. Yeah, in many where, ways, it would be like being a mute, like not being able to speak. Mm-hmm. Like It's just going to be awkward. Yeah, and that's just, um, it, it ties into the technology example that we were speaking about. Harsh, I mean, we've been talking for a long time, a variety of topics. It's going to be interesting as I fill out these timestamps. Um, so how about we wrap it up and we proceed for the next episode? Uh, any final words? No, man. As usual, this was a great podcast. I really enjoy speaking with you. And it's, you know, I like doing these free-flowing podcasts. Usually when I do podcasts, it's more of the person interviewing me. But this is more fun and I think more informative to the person listening as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a good break, right, Harsh? Because uh, we often are creating content, but it, uh, it when you and I are speaking with one another, it's just two friends catching up. And I personally never know what we're going to talk about. I doubt you know what we're going to talk about either. And that's what allows it to be a more creative experience. Yes, I think it's like a, it's a normal conversation between two people and not something mm-hmm. that's specifically intended to be more of a a teaching experience. Yeah, and personally for me, I enjoy stuff like this myself where I don't always want to learn. I don't always want to hear a lecture. I sometimes just want to join in on two people just having a conversation and I'm listening with I'm going for a walk, I'm at the gym, or I have a long commute. Yep, definitely. I, I think that is the case here. Excellent, Harsh. I mean, this unapologetic truth series has been fun. And if you would like to follow Harsh Strongman, Life Math Money, on his future endeavors and you want to stay updated with his products, I'm going to include all the links in the description box right on below. Be sure to hit that like uh, for the video, hit that subscribe, hit the bell notification, and never miss another video again. And thank you very much for joining the Unapologetic Truths episode. We'll catch you next time. Have a good day, everyone. See you.